Uh, our moderator is uh, Santiam from Intel. Uh, so we so he will host this uh, session and mainly talk about uh, toward the medium fault uh, efficiency in AI. So for any uh, participant, please turn on your camera, and then I will uh, give to give to uh, Santiam for the for this session. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Terry. So we've had a long day hearing about the different techniques, uh, different approaches, different results, some, some achieving um, 2x, some achieving 100x. Now let's talk about million x um, improvements in efficiency. This is meant to be more of an exploratory discussion. Um, we don't know what all will be achievable, but we want to be able to explore what are some of the approaches that can get us to those human-like capabilities of um, the neural networks of the next decades, and what kind of applications those would make enable. So I invite the panel members to please come on video as I introduce them one by one. First up, we have Professor Kaushik Roy. If you could please turn on your video. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay, Kashik is a distinguished professor, professor of ECE at Purdue University. His uh, research interests are in uh, microelectronics, signal processing. He's also one of the principal investigators at the Center for Brain-Inspired Computing, driving research into neuromorphic fabrics and neuro-inspired algorithms. Welcome, Kashik. Thanks. Next, we have Forrest Andola. Hello. Forrest is an independent research working on adapting neural networks, deep neural networks for NLP, for smartphone and other power constraint devices. He was one of the creators of the SqueezeNet architecture and a co-founder of DeepScale, which is now part of Tesla. Welcome, Forrest. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Professor Diana Markulescu. Hi, I'm here. Diana is a professor and the department chair of EC at UT Austin. Her interests include energy aware and uh, sustainable computing, architectures and design automation. Prior to UT, she was um, a professor at CMU. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. And lastly, we have uh, Ram Krishnamurthy. Yep, I'm here. Do, do you mind turning on your video? Yeah, it is on. Okay. Uh, Ram is a senior principal engineer at Intel. His uh, current research is on energy efficient and high speed circuit technologies for AI and machine learning accelerators, interconnects, hardware security, and in, in and near memory computing. Welcome, Ram. Thanks. Okay, so we heard about um, different uh, requirements, different achievements, different breakthroughs all through the day. We heard about extremely latency sensitive requirements for speech synthesis, uh, the highly power, power sensitive requirements from CERN that they cannot afford to have more additional cooling requirements. We also heard that the large models are showing no signs of saturation and it's a trend that continues to grow. At the same time, we heard from uh, Professor Yang Lu that there are modular design approaches that can go the other way. So before we get into some of the discussions, maybe we can take a quick one minute or two minute for each of you to tell how is it that the topic of energy efficient efficiency is related to machine learning. Uh, Kashik, how about you? Sure, are we um, using any slides or uh, are we just talking? Uh, we are just, just talking. To, okay, we're just talking, okay. Um, and so, I mean, when we're talking about, uh, you know, a million-fold million increase, uh, that's something interesting. The reason, of course, why it's interesting is uh, that if we look at today, and if we look at the workloads of today, then uh, there's a need to really think of a hardware which can potentially give you that 100-fold improvement in energy consumption. And in order to do that, I'm not so sure that CMOS by itself can do it in its current form. 
And if the architecture is certainly going to be whether a uh, you know standard von Neumann architecture or not. But on the other side of it, if you're really talking about five to ten years from now, uh, you know, getting um, uh, uh, again a million x improvement, uh, we have to really think in terms of the workload. The workload is going to be changing, right? And um, and so with that change in workload, and even if you have uh, that kind of uh, you know, I mean, uh, emerging hardware. Uh, devices and others coming into place, uh, the hardware certainly has to play a you know catch up role right? because we can we have this insatiable demand for and and, and uh, you know computation and memory is going to play a big role. So with that in mind, I mean let's see where we are today. So if I were to really think about uh, you know um, uh, you know today's deep learning, machine learning, and if I'm talking about uh, you know, network as an example, if I talk about uh, network architecture synthesis, right on transformer, let's say, and a big transformer, the amount of computation required is probably five to 10 zeta uh, operations. So that's like, you know, 10 to the 21. And, um, uh, and uh, so what you really have to think about is with Den Denard scaling stopping, there's a need to really think about coming up with the right kind of architecture, right? Maybe the von Neumann bottleneck is going to create a problem, and it is. And on the other side of it, there's a need for really thinking about emerging devices, if I can, and doing in-memory computing and other things to really think of an architecture that's going to be suitable for such uh, such workloads. And on the other side of it, if you really think of an edge intelligent, uh, you know, a, a edge inference and uh, edge devices, uh, you know, power constraint is absolutely important. And if I take an example of, for example, you know, object recognition and a smart glass as an example, then, um, you know, I mean, our simple calculations would show that if we try to do object recognition on, for example, a Google Edge TPU and uh, on, a, on, a, on a smart glass, uh, on using RetinaNet as an example, let's say, uh, you probably are looking at a battery life, uh, which is going to be probably less than, you know, half an hour or so. So uh, with that in mind, you know, there's a need for really thinking about not just the hardware, and the hardware is certainly going to play an important role. Can we really think about uh, coming up with the right kind of algorithms, uh, the right kind of circuits and architecture that we need, and of course, at the end of it, the right kind of hardware and the architecture that can potentially you know, do it. So uh, a million fold, I don't know, but certainly a good amount of improvement over what uh, uh, can be done today. All right. Cool. Diana, how about you? What does efficiency mean to you? Um, well, I've been working in energy efficient computing for a long time, um, and like Kaushik, I come from a from a different area, right? I have not done work in machine learning until machine learning came to me, um, and uh, through my students actually, because they were the ones interested in it. But um, I think. Um, Machine learning system design is um, inextricably linked to energy efficiency. Um, I mean, we've seen recent work that showed that training um, a large uh, NLP model or a sufficiently relevant NLP model takes um, a lot of energy. In fact, uh, the carbon footprint is equivalent to um, I don't know how many trips um, east coast to west coast uh, by plane or um, anything that um, you would you would imagine as being very um, inefficient, right? I mean, we wouldn't think that this is the the footprint, the energy footprint of that. But um, um, I I think um, to some extent what what Kaushik said um, is true. We are here. We're talking about machine learning to the extent that we are, because technology brought us here, and that technology is seamless. And uh, the architecture that actually made that happen is pretty much whatever GPUs brought to us, um, um, and then the algorithms that they enable. So, in some, in, to some extent, we are locked in this by the technology that exists, the circuits, the architecture, and the algorithms. So, if we want to get the million-fold, um, uh, I guess, efficiency or um, savings. Um, my question will be how much are you are you willing to wait for uh, an inference to happen or perhaps um, for um, a different task to to be enabled because um, that kind of energy efficiency is the energy efficiency of, of, of the human brain or typically um, any mammal that does image recognition or object recognition 
Um, but um, again, we're very poor in other things, right? That the, the machines can help us. So I think it's a, it's a question of what are you willing to, to trade off um, and what are the things you're willing to wait to be implemented because not everything is going to, uh, to happen. Um, so um, yes, we do need new architectures, we do need new algorithms and we do need new technologies and um, a different state mind, I guess, uh, that would allow us to look at the problem differently. So um, I don't know, I think the, the reason we're, um, we're, we're, we're probably right now at the level of uh, bark or tree level, we need to move to forest level to, to actually see the big picture because uh, it's not just max or convolutions. Um, these are the tools that we currently have, but because we are using the technology that we have right now, um, perhaps we have to move back a little bit and think of it in a more holistic fashion. And I'll let others, others talk about that. Sounds great. Forrest, any opening thoughts from you? I'd love to talk about something forest level. So, um, <laughs> great. Segment. I was avoiding that fun. <laughs> we've got we've got the rest of the the time to talk about how we might get this millionfold uh, improvement. So let me just spend my remarks here talking about why we might want this. So just piling on to what others have said about energy efficiency and its relationship to carbon emissions and climate change. Um, I think there's this dream right now that um, natural language processing will help us become much more productive as we read and write messages. So the human race, you know, across Facebook, uh, email, um, WhatsApp, et cetera, we write about 300 billion messages per day. And if you were to use something like GPT-3 to autocomplete as we write, so if you use Gmail lately, you probably have already experienced this autocompleting feature. Um, GPT-3 purportedly can do it much better but if all of us were, were to go about writing our, our messages like that, where every time we type something, it fills in the next few words, um, running that in a data center, at least one that, that has the traditional mix of coal, um, natural gas, and a little bit of solar powering it, would emit more carbon than Germany if we were to do that and have everybody using that technology. And, um, you know, uh, auto-completing emails is just one of probably thousands of different applications of AI that are going to become ubiquitous. And so we have to think very, very carefully about how to make this um, something that has a negligible climate impact as opposed to something that has a disastrous climate impact. And that's part of what motivates me to work in this area. That's a great perspective. Thank you. And Ram, any opening thoughts from you? Sure, I have a couple of slides, uh, Satyam, that I just want to uh, flash real quick and in a couple of minutes just open motivate some uh, opening thoughts on that. So please let me know uh, when that just shows up, shows up. Are you able to see me and hear me? Looks good. So I've spent a bulk of my uh, research here at Intel Labs on energy efficient circuit technologies at the intersection of process uh, and uh, circuit co-design for microprocessors and SOCs. More recently, uh, we've been looking at uh, uh, energy efficient design for process architecture and circuit design co-optimization towards this goal of uh, uh, artificial intelligence accelerators and how can we approach this million fold efficiency in AI. So to share some opening uh, perspectives, there's this big deluge of data uh, that we are all, uh, we've seen uh, presentations throughout today in this workshop that's uh, spoken eloquently about all this. But one key thing that uh, we see here is the trajectory of the data going in the wrong direction. Uh, it's projected over this within the next few years uh, to scale up to 175 zeta bytes of data, and almost 75% of that data is being generated by IoT edge devices. So clearly, there's a huge uh, problem at our hands uh, where the scale of the data, uh, and this is just raw data that's being produced. Uh, is simply unprocessable unless we have democratization of performance and everybody has an exascale computer in their backyard. Uh, these 100 billion intelligent connected devices uh, performing exascale computing uh, will be unable to handle this at any reasonable power efficiency. At the same time, from a business perspective, we see lucrative value here. These autonomous driving IoT network devices at the edge that produce and consume and process this data scales north of $60 billion in uh, revenue opportunity. So clearly this is a huge deal. So we have to focus on this, but the key message here is the challenges 
we cannot process 175 zeta bytes of data. So the first thing is to get at this data and then knock it down to what is meaningful information within that data and then eventually what is the actionable uh, knowledge in that data. Something similar to human intelligence where we don't absorb everything that we see and hear throughout the entire day. The human brain is very capable of knowing what is useful information out of that. So clearly it will be prohibited to process this data and I see that as the first challenge. The second challenge of course is the exploding AI models itself, scaling up to terabytes of data. It's simply going to be prohibitive to load this terabytes of AI models onto a chip and operate on them. We can pack as many matrix multipliers with all the sparsity and compression, all the techniques that were described uh, in the papers this uh, today's workshop. However, the data movement energy is going to swamp out any energy consumption on the chip for processing such uh, terabytes of models. What we mean by that is that even the projected future HBM3, HBM4 off chip memories cannot handle this data at reasonable efficiencies. We are looking at three to four picojoules per bit of data movement energy, whereas in today's 10 nanometer technology, I can easily build those matrix multiplier data paths at sub 0.1 picojoules per bit. So you can clearly ski the scale. The challenge is not the operations, the challenge is data movement energy. Now on the solution space, uh, quick early remarks. Uh, we can talk in more detail, but one of them is embedded AI acceleration space. I really think one solution space that should be explored further is co-optimization of silicon process emerging technology together with architecture, and that's what this shows. By doing that, it's possible. We have shown that you can you, you, you can't get a million X, but certainly for deep learning boost and DL boost extensions, we've demonstrated 30 X uh, up to up to that scale of uh, improvements. So clearly optimization of process technology, silicon technology and architecture. And the second is uh, what Professor Roy alluded to regarding uh, neuromorphic computing. Uh, we believe that uh, this trans uh, translation from conventional von Neumann architectures to spiking neural network based neuromorphic computing models is, has potential. The reason for that is all the data is encoded and transmitted as spikes. And so it's far lower energy orders of magnitude better than doing these binary digital data path operations. So we've shown that in our uh, recent publication, we can pack almost 4,000 neurons within a millimeter square. We also recently explored uh, compute in and near memory architectures to minimize that data movement energy, bring as much of the model as close to the arithmetic as possible by fusing compute and memory together. And finally, I think having dedicated uh, energy efficient neural network accelerators on the chip that can potentially achieve 10 to 100x improvement in energy efficiency is also one of the potential directions. So with that, I'll pause and then we can talk more in detail. All right, thanks. Uh, let's start uh, with something start that, uh, that uh, you just called out, uh, about, the about the non conventional non compute architectures such as in memory compute and yeah. spiking Spike. networks. What is preventing us from having a more broad adoption of these technologies? What are some of the challenges that you see? Maybe you and Kaushik can start. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll let Professor Roy speak about it. He he actually has a full center and we've collaborated closely with Professor Roy, so he's definitely has the expertise and the authority on that. So I'll I'll defer to Professor Roy to answer first. Hey, uh, Ram, thanks. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, we've been looking at, uh, you know, spiking and neuromorphic computing. I mean, brain-inspired computing. The question, of course, is that uh, we have an existential proof that uh, brain is efficient. And um, so the question is that, is it uh, possible that we can use some cues from the brain to do some uh, interesting computing? So to that effect, uh, you know, uh, a few of the things that you can look at, and uh, as uh, Ram mentioned, as a part of our center, we've been looking at a couple of things. Uh, we're looking at uh, the, you know, uh, visual ventral system and some of the work which is being done by the neuroscience folks at MIT, are uh, working with them to really come up with an uh, sort of a network uh, architecture, which is uh, quote unquote brain like, you know, very similar to what the visual ven ventral system of uh, uh, of uh, Rhesus monkey is, because there's some experiments done and based on the activities of each of the layers, V1, V2, you know, V4, IT of the brain, can I really come up with a network architecture which is very similar to that? And so that's one of the uh, ideas is looking at uh, architectural point of view, the network architecture. On the other side of it, uh, as uh, Ram was mentioning, you know, I mean, if you really look at spikes and spikes do have an advantage, uh, you know, I mean, if, you, if the spikes are rare and if you do the computation with spikes, uh, then you can potentially think of an event-driven hardware 
And with the very few spikes, there's a potential of getting a huge amount of energy efficiency improvement. Now, things don't come for free. You do really have to think about what kind of input coding that you do, right? Uh, turns out if you really do rate coding, that may not be the most efficient one. You know, learning uh, uh, rate coded ones uh, certainly can be done easily because it has a lot of similarities with, for example, a ReLU-based uh, neural network. On the other side of it, more time-based coding could be more interesting, right? Or for, for that matter, you know, think of, um, you know, um, uh, having proper sensors like the DVS cameras, which actually would produce spikes when there's a relative, uh, you know, motion between the camera and the objects around it, right? And if such spikes are rare, can you learn directly from those spikes? Huh? And using efficiently, in some ways we still don't do that, efficiently the timing information. So which is certainly missing, for example, in a, in a standard ANN. So if you're able to do that effectively, there are you know, interesting possibilities, but also remember that uh, you know, the architecture has to be suitable for that. I mean, even driven architecture. And along with that, you have to also think about the fact that this time you have to also think about other memories other than the parameters and, and the, uh, in the synaptic memories, you have to also look about the memory potential and that has to be stored properly. And uh, you know, so there are uh, you know very interesting possibilities. And uh, there's a good amount of work which is going on. And from Intel, uh, you know, there's a good amount of work on architecture. Lohi as an example of uh, such a uh, you know spiking architecture um, that we actually sometimes try to implement our algorithms on. Um, so the possibilities are, I feel, uh, quite uh, quite enormous. Still a long way to go, but uh, the possibilities of energy improvement, as I said, uh, could be but we large. And I'll, I'll, I'll add to that and say I, would, uh, I want to call out the spectacular work going on at the SRC Chump Center that uh, Professor Kaushik Roy is leading on exactly this aspect to look at architecture, algorithms, workloads for spiking neural networks, how to bring them more into the mainstream and realize all those efficiency benefits that we have shown. At an elementary level, if we imagine that the data can be encoded to as little as a simple impulse spike, can imagine how much of energy efficiency that saves compared to storing all and loading and processing all those zettabytes of data where typically today's conventional models operate on 8, 16 bits of data. And you go into training, it's an even more horrendous experience. We are looking at Bfloat 16 with 16 bit data paths that just uh, keep, keep uh, accumulating the loops and you can see how much of round off accuracy you're going to tolerate. Whereas in the case of a spiking neural network, you can condense all that to dramatic energy efficiency improvements. We have an Intel neuromorphic research community that we have formulated uh, that Kaushik alluded to, where we have several universities and uh, industry partners that are coming together as well as national labs to address some of these things that you mentioned, Satya. Okay. Well, um, Forrest and Diana, anything to add? This is a open discussion format. <laughs> Otherwise, um, I can modify the question. Uh, I, a bit. I just want to no. I just want to say one one thing. Uh, I think um, you know, trying to I, I, spiking neural networks are great uh, a great direction to look into. Um, but I, I think we want to be careful about trying to just replicate how brain works uh, or the brain functionality. And I'll give an example. Um, the recent. Um, um, protein folding example that um, you know was basically showed what you can do with with a um, a really well done I guess piece of machine learning um, I mean and it's something that humans were unable to do even in large quantities of you know crowdsourcing we remember the um, folded at home project um, so I think there is value in looking at current technology because there are still uh, problems we can solve with the current um, paradigms, but they're still very inefficient, right? So uh, so I think it, it there is still value to bridge the gap between, yes, we want to advance on the technology side, but there's all this, all of this body of, um, you know, we have the algorithms, the architectures, the, the current um, basically paradigms that we're using that, you know, have yet to become truly energy efficient, uh, although they do solve really important problems. So I, um, while we're, you know, we're having 
uh, Kaushik and, and Ram work on on these amazing technologies, new technologies that would potentially replace silicon uh, or CMOS. Um, I think we want to, to think about what can we do with the current technology, but use it more efficiently because they do have a value. Yeah, as I can attest to from you know my own work going back to SqueezeNet as well as much more recent stuff, there's tons of opportunity to take more kind of tensor computation based approaches to, to deep learning that almost everybody uses um, who does who does uh, deep neural network and production kind of work and um, you know really reimagine some of the architecture choices, some of the small constants to realize big improvements. Um, I, I think if you look back in the history of AI over the last 40 or 50 years, there have been these big um, shakeups every so often, right? I mean, you know, the the invention of support vector machines were a big shakeup. The transition from support vector machines to deep neural networks, which were themselves inspired by multi-layer perceptrons that were a shakeup from 20 years before. Um, there, there, there are these big stair-step improvements that have happened. I, I think there are several more stair steps that we have to invent before we do anything at all like like humans and um and many facets right in terms of really being bio inspired like bruno Oshausen, a neuroscientist at berkeley would tell you that neural networks that we often use today may, may be the exception of of kaushik roy's more exotic stuff but neural nets i use today are inspired by a 1950s understanding of the human brain and have almost nothing to do with what we've learned since then um and so I'm under no delusions that mo most of us are doing or anything anything like the human brain at all, um, which presents two opportunities. One is to be, get more bio-inspired and, and do something revolutionary in research. Um, and the other opportunity, I think, is with what we've invented today, with, with the next round of efficiency improvements to that, um, actually can be really powerful. I think it can be as big as the software industry. Like, you know, um, Andreessen Horwitz in 2011 said that, um, you know, software is eating the world, replacing one of the things that we used to do by hand or using using custom hardware. I think um, AI as we know it today, especially if we can crack these efficiency problems, um, will eat a whole bunch of things that we couldn't automate with procedural software. And so there's a huge opportunity, billions, maybe trillion plus dollar market but then the bio-inspired thing is like the thing that comes after what we're doing right now. Which uh, begs a good question. Uh, what role does, what role can software play in easing that transition? While we are exploring these um, limitations of hardware, can software provide the breakthrough for the next round of effic efficiencies? And at the same time, when we get to the point where we have this new generation of architectures, can software ease the transition from the more conventional network architectures onto the more exotic ones without providing a big disturbance to the ecosystem that has been established. Um, yeah, any, anytime you're not getting peak efficiency on some neural net, on some hardware, you can improve the software typically, right? At least to some extent. Yeah, we see, we saw this also when we switched from single core to multi-core, right? I mean, we, we pushed single core until we could no longer because of power density and, you know, on-chip temperature. Um, and then we had to switch to multi-core because we had to. And then who had to pick up the slack? Uh, well, you have to program those cores and software had to do it. So I think we're in the same kind of situation here. And everyone kept saying, oh, Moore's law is dying. We need to find a replacement for, for CMOS. Um, from general purpose computing perspective, that didn't happen because we always were able to find something. So I think we're while, while we're waiting for the replacement for CMOS in machine learning, I think we can still get, you know, improvements from the software and, you know, first algorithmic, then software and, you know, together applications even because the way we, we think about applications and the way tests are defined could be very different. And I think I cut off Kaushik. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I was just going to go back to the previous um, comment about uh, neuromorphic and brain like and uh, forest. Yes, we have the best network and no question about it. <laughs> However, um, the idea is to do neuromorphic or take cues from the brain is uh, not to really, it's a means to an end, right? It's to see if it's possible to get an energy efficiency. It doesn't, and in fact, we don't even understand the brain. We all know that, right? I mean, so it's a little thing here, a little thing there, as you know, Ram was talking about, I mean, if we can, and, and, and it's not even sure if it's gonna do it. 
uh, it's not it's not even sure that you're going to get an improvement. If you certainly use a standard GPU, uh, you're actually going to be way worse than uh, you know uh, um, uh, the standard deep learning that you do. You know, way way worse because their training is going to be difficult. But then again, and and inference is going to be really bad. But then again, the question, of course, is if we have the right algorithms, and there's a need for really thinking about it, the right algorithms and the right kind of architecture, right, and the hardware to do that. And with even drivenness and the sparsity in, uh, that comes associated with it, and proper in-memory or near-memory computing in some ways, that can potentially, uh, you know, give it. And there's no guarantee. It's all a question of research at this moment. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, nobody knows uh, which one is better, uh, but uh, there's a need for really uh, exploring, I would say, at least from an university point of view. And I uh, second what Diana just said. Uh, it's going to be a continuum of improvement. I don't think we're going to get that million fold uh, AI efficiency uh, overnight or within just the next few years with one quantum leap. Uh, the way how we are positioning is, is there's going to be the intermediate steps like having DL boost instructions added to the Xeon architecture, existing NPU, CPU, XPU architectures that will give you somewhat of a leap in energy efficiency. And what we calibrated that and some of the workloads that were shown for Galaxy processing and uh, uh, others uh, uh, throughout today's workshop also indicated that we're looking at something of the scales of double digit, uh, maybe 100x or so. So that's one uh, one core area where hardware software co-design architecture involvement uh, is, is all going to uh, uh, pr provide those benefits. And clearly, as far as said, software is going to be important in that. And then there is as we get to that over the next few years, we are also cognizant of other brain like brain inspired bio inspired models, emerging models. There are some new emerging technologies beyond seven nanometer where you can fuse the entire memory and the compute together into a single cell. So that would be like a holy grail of efficiency improvement. There is no such thing as a compute and there is no such separate thing as a memory if all that can be combined together. So there's some pioneering research to be done in that space, but uh, I definitely agree with what Diana said. All right, we'll switch gears a little bit from the more exotic to something more relatable and in the present. So we, there has been talk about how much, what's the energy footprint of training a large NLP model. But thinking about it, we are essentially distilling the lifetime worth of learning into a few weeks or months of training a neural network. So is energy the cost of achieving that kind of uh, learning in such a short time? What are your thoughts on that? Can that ever be overcome? Well, if that's so here's the, something if that's interesting, right? So there's this like logarithmic relationship between model size and and um, or kind of like model computational cost and how good of accuracy you get in a couple different ways, right? Like usually it's the first few iterations of training you get most of your accuracy, and then you add a lot more iterations and you get very little more accuracy. Is that extra accuracy worth it or not? That varies. Similarly, like you know, there there are certain points in the model design space where um, adding more layers, more parameters has very diminishing returns or no returns at all. Um, and so basically, like, I don't really buy the argument that there's this inherent cost of like lifetime or more worth of compute cycles to train one of these models because you can train an almost as good model in like one tenth or one one hundredth of the time. And it's not like that didn't go through the whole process. I'll just make one quick addition to Forrest's comment, and it's uh, it's it's the case to be made about all these zettabytes of data. We talk about data sets uh, exploding exponentially, uh, but really we have to be cognizant that all that is just raw data. Most of that is not not exactly meaningful information. So how we extract out meaningful information, which is what is needed to gain knowledge and uh, intelligence, uh, is really so actionable intelligence is more important. We typically try to correlate uh, artificial intelligence to human intelligence, but uh, actionable intelligence is something that uh, we are leaving out of the equation. We need to focus more on that. Otherwise, there's no way we can load these terabyte models of AI onto a chip and process them at a meaningful energy efficiency. Anything to add, Kashika Diana, before we go to the next one? No, I agree. All right. Yeah, no, <laughs> there's okay. nothing to add. I want to touch upon two points which were uh, covered in the course of the day. Uh, one is somewhat related to what Ram was saying. We have these zettabytes of data, and uh, one of the arts or uh, challenges is to clean out the right side of subset of that data to train upon. 
Uh, my question is, does that make the training uh, inherent uh, more prone to exposing some of the biases or underrepresentations of certain categories uh, as opposed to training on just a, lot, a more diverse set of data? So I think data set balance is super important, right? So um, there, so there's been a lot of stuff lately, especially with Tim Netgrubru leaving Google and the whole discussion online lately, um, where more and more people are becoming aware of the downsides of self-supervised or unsupervised learning on data that you or your team have not actually studied carefully. Um, so historically, if you look at computer vision or you look at speech recognition, most of the successful approaches have required that someone actually transcribes the audio and labels it, right? And that, or that someone actually labels faces and people and objects and images and tags them with their attributes. And when you have that annotation process happen, it gives you the opportunity that if you want to, you can have those humans who are going through the data set also say, okay, I want to keep track of what's the balance of where this data came from around the world or what socioeconomic kind of backgrounds the different people who wrote these sentences, created these images, created these audio snippets came from. Um, are there, is there unsafe or low quality or racist or otherwise content that we don't want the model to learn that we can reject while going through all this data manually like we would do anyway? Where this gets interesting is when you look at the latest breakthrough in natural language processing starting around 2018 with BERT, where people got better than ever at taking even larger data sets. You take all of Wikipedia and take thousands of open source, uncopyrighted books, um, put them into a very large data set. No, no human on that research team ever like read all of Wikipedia, I'm assuming, right? So you're, you're, you've got this sort of, um, unknown quantity data set. And, um, you know, I, I think the more we go in that direction, the more we're failing to censor whether the models are being trained to do the things that actually um, match what we'd like the system to do versus do not match. Um, and so I, I think really the, the, you know, to get back to your original question, it's, it's really um, less about huge data sets being um, the answer or um, anything else, it's can we get the data set that best matches what we want the model to learn and can we pay whatever the cost is to do that? Right, so I think we, we have a, an opportunity here, right? Because like you said, we can do this in a matter of days. We can learn, um, you know, th thousands of years worth of knowledge fast, but that comes at the price of embedding in whatever we learn all the implicit biases and hardwiring that we basically inherited as humans through our upbringing, through the societal so social norms, right, that we see around us. And the, the makeup of what we see is the result of those being manifested through our lifetimes, but even more so before, before us. So like Forrest said, we should aim to build these models um, based on what we'd like to project rather than what we actually have. So, um, and it, you know, it, we can easily say like, I, I have many friends in other disciplines who use Mechanical Turk and they say, oh, I'm just going to use the makeup of the demographics of, you know, typical US, for example, but that's not sufficient because, you know, um, age or gender or racial makeup is not sufficient to tell us about what their beliefs are and what transpire, tra transpires uh, through the, um, I guess, the actions that they take, especially in supervised learning, like Forrest said. So, um, so I think it's a, it's, it's an opportunity, a, resp a big responsibility and um, the ethics implications are actually huge and they should not be discounted. And I, I think w what our responsibility as academics is, it's to make sure that um, we do this in the classroom as well, because um, it's it, it ha it's going to have deep implications. From a AI model perspective, one more uh, observation is the exploding model complexities. They're growing to terabytes of AI models. Uh, so when we talk about energy efficiency improvement, first we have to zoom in and look at where that energy is going in the first place. A terabyte model going through HPM3 or HPM4 is going to consume three to four picojoules per bit of moving that data into the chip in the first place. And especially, Satyam, you highlighted about edge intelligence for that million-fold AI efficiency. And now you're talking about edge SOC chips in the 
edge of the network with the total power budget of the SOC is of the order of one watt. So how much of that are we willing to allocate for AI edge processing? And within that, how much of the power is going to be burnt in simply moving these terabyte models in and out of the chip? That's why it's becoming prohibitive and most people are punting the problem to solve this at the cloud level and postpone, uh, move all the data, all the raw data up to the cloud or data center and then do all the processing there. But if edge SOC AI is your goal uh, for that million fold AI efficiency, we need to rethink the, rethink the whole uh, uh, AI model uh, explosion. That's great. I would put forth a question to the panel and then open up to the audience to also start contributing. Uh, we talked about uh, a, a wholesale rethink of the entire pipeline. Right? That's, that's essentially what you were saying, Ram, that we have to think about everything. Where are we spending energy? What are our design goals and so on? So 30, 40 years from now, are we going to still be running convolutions? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. I don't know if I'm going to be around, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, pretty much everyone on the on the attendee list to feel free to come up on video. Uh, I know Kushal has been raising his hand for a long time. It must be hurting. Uh, Kushal, you can go first. Meanwhile, others, please uh, start queuing up for questions to the panel. Can I? So, am I going first? Yeah. Oh, awesome panel. Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah, thanks for a, I mean, I'm happy that it's a virtual hand raise or else it would really hurt. <laughs> so I just wanted to plus one to what Diana said. So I am, I mean, I, I'm working at NVIDIA now, but one of the big problem that we are trying to solve is utilization. So even if we have supercomputers, internal as well as we power many of the supercomputers, utilization is a big problem, right? And that is that is going to be true for all the ASICs and all the FPGAs that we are architecting for these AI ML use cases, right? So the, util, the low utilization is due to multiple facets, system memory to device copy, as well as uh, you know GPU to GPU, I mean device to device transfer, as well as device to storage transfer. But if you look at the, you know, the amount of innovation that has happened on the, on the core processing elements versus the the NIC and the switches, they are in the storage. They are far behind, and we have to bridge this gap somehow. Because the moment you leap or go through the storage hierarchy, the memory hierarchy, your your you know performance goes down significantly, orders of magnitude. And we have to bridge this gap because, as with ASIC and more powerful GPUs, what's happening is that the compute time is going down, but you know, Amdahl's law ultimately gets you right. So anyway, I, I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, this has been a problem for a while, right? That, um, you know, compute is improving quite rapidly. It used to be because of transistors. Now it's more because of clever architectures and somewhat making transistors smaller a little bit still. Um, but, you know, the, on, on a good decade, memory only gets twice as um, energy efficient every four years, right? Sometimes it slips to six years. And, um, you know, Ethernet and so forth um, or InfiniBand is improving at even slower rates. So, yeah, there's this, this divergence of what you can do once you're in the registers of a chip uh, to do compute versus moving data around. So pushing things to the edge, I think, is going to be really important. Um, partially be, because I don't think we're going to be able to realistically build um, enough bandwidth to stream everything back to the cloud that needs to be processed, uh, even if we do discard a lot of the information beforehand. And I also think that there are going to be more and more concerns about privacy of sending people's personal data to the cloud. You know, virtual assistants, I, I think a lot of people are holding back from using them because they don't want um, you know, to be in Alexa's training set uh, with engineers listening to their voice for the next 40 years trying to figure out what the heck they were saying. Right. Cool. So I, I think the answer is move computation closer to storage or eventually computing memory, but I'm going to let Kaushik and Ram talk about that because <laughs> I don't actually work on that. <laughs> I, I was just going to say there's been a surge in uh, activity, lots of startups looking at compute in memory, compute near memory recently for precisely that reason. For those of you who attended the International Solid State Circuits Conference earlier this year, 
there's an entire session focused on uh, compute in and near memory architecture uh, circuit uh, process technology code design and that clearly uh, hits the problem right at its heart uh, we understand that moving data from off chip memory to on chip uh, cache and thereafter processing uh, is is highly inefficient so as much as we can do to marry compute and memory together and fuse them together is going to mitigate that data movement energy and, and that really is the dominant energy we can easily build uh, matrix multipliers in today's uh, seven nanometer technology that can be sub 0.1 picojoules per bit of uh, arithmetic data path uh, depending on what precision you want for inferencing uh, or training uh, but if it's going to cost single digit picojoules per bit to move even one bit of that data uh, off chip back and forth uh, we can only have hundreds of megabytes maximum cache on a chip uh, we are reticle uh, area limited in what the steppers can do uh, so do the math you can see zeta bytes outside thing outside terabyte model sizes 100 megabytes on the chip how many cycles it's going to take and how many picojoules it's going to do it so it's it's fairly okay, easy to Patrick, i have a question for you about all this so the in principle it makes sense um, I've definitely seen some startups talk about compute and memory, and then you look at what they're doing, and it's really just a lot of small chips with a big cache and small processor, and they call that a memory that has a processor on it. Um, is there something more fundamental going on here that's 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 emerging about compute and memory? Yeah, there's a dichotomy there. That's a that's a fair observation, and I I concur that uh, it's it's still in its infancy. Uh, we've done some research, uh, as I showed. There's a publication where we're looking at compute and memory fusing together. Uh, there's more to be done, uh, but primarily the uh, the focus of many startups uh, and others are uh, at the edge SOC levels. So that's why the memory sizes are small, like you mentioned. Uh, however, really the 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 big trick up their sleeve is emerging memory technologies where we can fuse the compute logic and memory bit cell uh, storage together. Uh, thereby you can have essentially computational storage uh, at a fraction of the energy that you would otherwise consume. So that's really the, the long range uh, goal here. Yeah, I mean, just to add to it, I mean, uh, you know, what uh, Ram said is absolutely right. I mean, there's a need for really thinking about, uh, you know, doing the computation in the memory itself if you can. And uh, you know, while you can do it in CMOS, it uh, probably would be a lot more efficient to really look at some of these emerging technologies like RAMs and PC RAMs, or in fact, even SDTM RAMs. The problem with PC RAMs and RAMs is that there's an endurance problem, right? I mean, you can't write into these uh, devices too many times. Probably endurance is of the order of about 10 to the five or so. Uh, for these RAMs or PC RAMs, whereas SDT devices are a little bit better. Uh, of course, it's uh, almost close to, I mean, in terms of endurance, almost close to, you know, CMOS. Uh, but, and on the other side of it, if you look at the area uh, advantages that you have with, um, you know, RAMs, uh, the RAM memory uh, size would be about 16 F squared or so, 15 to 16 F squared, whereas an SDT devices, depending on what kind of SDT devices that you're looking at, Probably of the order of about you know 30 to 40 uh, you know uh, 30 f squared to almost about 80 f squared, whereas the uh, you know, CMOS side of it is what uh, uh, you know it's 140 f squared. If you're really looking at, uh, for example, uh, the 60 cells. Now also remember that when your memory size goes down, you have an advantage that you don't go off chip too many times. But then again, with an RM, you're not able to write it, so you have to really think about replicating a bunch of these uh, you know RM based chips rather than having a DM. So I guess we are a, of, yeah, a little bit, so for we are Ram, a little bit over. Guess. We'll take one more question from Raj and then uh, wind up. Sorry to cut you short, Forrest. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, well, we talk about machine learning and, and, and see the inefficiency in current systems, hardware, software, and the big other thing coming around, which is around the corner, which has always been quantum computing. So my question is very open-ended. Do you guys see these two sort of working as complementary to different paradigm? Would there be some emerging field in between where certain kind of machine learning algorithm run very efficiently on those hardwares? Or, or, or what, what are your thoughts are just, just at a very you know high level? So anyone wants to take on that? I mean, to the extent that uh, quantum computing or quantum technology can help with, um, I guess, the both the algorithmic and you know technology side, sure, it can be an answer. But I think it's even further from from you know being reality than other 
directions that are being pursued. Kaushi, if you bring ahead. me, if you bring yeah. me an efficient quantum computer, I would love to try putting machine learning on it. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, it's right. a, it's a, the question, of course, is what is quantum AI? You know, I mean, are we going to be really designing better networks uh, using quantum computing? Uh, and then quantum computing may not be quite suitable for the kind of uh, things that we do in AI. So uh, you need to sort of uh, develop the right kind of algorithms to do that, too. So uh, that, that's an interesting question. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And we'll take, let's just take a 30 seconds each to give a closing closing point of view before we conclude. Uh, Forrest, since I cut you short, you get the first one. Any yes, closing sure. thoughts? Um, well, I, I think it's a bright future for all of these things. I mean, I, I think um, it took, uh, depending how you count, 20 or 30 years for, for neural nets to go from, from a few people uh, in Canada and, and a few a few places um, working in relative obscurity to really being being something that everybody can use for a variety of applications. So I have no doubt that almost everything we've talked about on some timeline will will turn out to be really useful. Right, Ram. Yeah, I think we are in the middle of it. Uh, it's going to be critical to have uh, uh, some quantum leaps in energy efficiency. Uh, we are well on our way to get to that million fold efficiency, but it's going to take a while. We'll need uh, architectures, hardware, software, co-design, as well as silicon process technology, architecture, circuit design, co-optimization to enable that. Cool, Diana. Yeah, so um, I think the the concept of energy efficient machine learning is going to be uh, redundant because you have to be energy efficient when you're going to do machine learning, just like with a, every other piece of computing or algorithmic uh, transformation. So energy is, is really important as, as a constraint. So uh, I think it's here to stay with us. All right, Kashik. Yeah, that's true. Energy is certainly here uh, with us to stay. And so uh, just like timing and other uh, kinds of things that we look at, uh, this is certainly an exciting time, no question about it. I mean, I tell my students that uh, this is a great time to do PhD. Right, uh, no dearth of topics, um, and uh, so on the other side of it, I mean, from the industry point of view, there's a there's a huge number of opportunities, right, to do something exciting. So, good time. All right. Well, with that, we come to the end of the panel. We went a little bit over time, so sorry, Terry, about that. But thank you to uh, Ram, Forrest, Kaushik, and Diana for the valuable insights, and. Uh, we hope we'll uh, come back again and have a discussion sometime next year. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Terry, back Thanks. to you.